That's Sunday night at 9 Eastern and Pacific. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This is America and the Courts, C-SPAN's weekly look at the federal judiciary. In this edition, a federal court examines the issue of term limits for state legislators. The oral argument before the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco Chronicle's legal affairs writer, Harriet Chang. Harriet Chang, legal affairs writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. In about 15 minutes, our audience is going to see oral argument in a case called Bates versus Jones, and it has to do with Proposition 140 here in California. What is Proposition 140? Well, Proposition 140 was passed by uh, the state of California, the people of California, in 1990. Uh, it basically imposes a lifetime ban on um, state legislators, everything from uh, assemblymen, state senators, as well as 11 um, political, uh, statewide political offices. Um, it has been challenged in state court, and now it's being challenged in federal court. It survived in the state court. And we'll see if it, it survives in the federal court. That's 1990, so it's been around a while. But why is it still under challenge? Well, it's been under challenge because as everything in the courts go, it goes very slowly. Uh, the California Supreme Court actually upheld it in 1991. There was a question as far as whether it upset the balance between the legislature and the governor. Uh, what it does is it limits uh, state lawmakers to either six years or eight years maximum and that's it it's a lifetime ban after that uh, so we are now starting to see it hit in 1996 and in 1998 what happened was the california supreme court upheld it in 1991 they said there was you know it, it served a good purpose as far as uprooting a lot of the entrenched bureaucracy uh, and they felt that it, there were too many legislators in who had too much power to run again and it was basically it was a very a uh, good public interest as far as getting rid of a lot of these politicians. By what margin did it pass in the first place? It passed by a 52 to 48 margin. Is there any sense here that the, uh, the, do the courts feel under any pressure, as you observe it, to uh, support what the people have voted on? Is there a legal issue that goes over and above uh, the popularity of this? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, you'll see there's a different approach by the courts, however, in this. Uh, when the California Supreme Court upheld the uh, Prop 140, they said that uh, this is a ca that, that was a court that was very reluctant to overturn any initiative. They, a lot of times, they acknowledged the public interest and the public will and what the public wanted, and the public wanted uh, to get rid of a lot of the incumbents. Uh, but we had a decision that was. Um, so we had the California Supreme Court decision. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to take up that decision, and so and they let it stand. So then you had, in 1996, uh, Tom Bates, an assemblyman from the Bay Area, who sued in federal court and said, this is unconstitutional. By imposing a lifetime ban, it is, uh, it, it is a, such an extreme measure that we feel it is, violates the federal constitution. So you had a federal judge this past April rule that it was un unconstitutional. It was an, ex such an extreme measure. Now, she acknowledged that there is a public interest here, that the public will was to uh, uproot some of the entrenched bureaucracy. But th what the federal judge said was, you know, there are other measures you can take besides a lifetime ban. So she also acknowledged the public will. But she said, you know, you can, you can meet that public will by other means. And who was that federal judge? That was Claudia Wilkin who is uh, relatively new, but she, is, uh, she was one of those who was actually um, uh, supported by all the other judges on the court, which is very unusual, and she's moving up very quickly. And you told us who Tom Bates was. Who's Jones? Jones. In Bates v. Jones. Oh, Jones. That is the, uh, the one of the sponsors of the bill. Who is going to hear this oral argument? 
It'll be a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is, uh, so they're hearing the appeal from Judge Wilkins' decision in April. Uh, there are three ju judges on this panel. Uh, one is Judge Sneed, another is Judge Reinhardt, and a third is Judge Fletcher. Uh, Judge Sneed is considered a conservative. Judge Reinhardt, you may have heard, his name is Stephen Reinhardt, he's from Los Angeles, his, uh, he has his wife, I, is associated with the ACLU, and he's the one that wrote California's Right to Die decision which uh, the U.S. Supreme Court just overturned. Uh, the third is Betty Fletcher, and she is the uh, mother of Willie Fletcher, who was nominated for the federal court. And then we got into the little nepotism question that uh, arose in Washington. She's also considered a liberal. How big is the Ninth Circuit? Uh, it's the biggest of the circuits. It's nine western states, uh, Guam, northern Mariana Islands. Uh, geographically, population-wise, it's the biggest. In fact, there is now a move in Congress that, uh, to try to split it up. There have been prior attempts, but uh, they've all failed. I don't know if this one will succeed either, but it is, it is unquestionably the largest, and it has been a trendsetter. It's also been the, uh, behind many controversial decisions. We're talking about term limits, so what are the national implications for this if the term limits are upheld? Well, if they're upheld, this is becoming a, a part of a national movement that started with Oklahoma in 1990, and several other, other states have followed. Um, if they are upheld, California is one of the few, though, ha that has lifetime uh, bans, and that is, I think, s about six other states also uh, have similar bans, so it could have that impact. But remember, we're only talking about state um, state uh, lawmakers. We're not talking about congressional, and the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled on that. Is there a possibility that this case will get to the Supreme Court? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sure it's, it's inevitable. However, this court rules that whoever loses will go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then what are the uh, legal implications of a Supreme Court ruling? Because you said they've already ruled on term limits. What would they be ruling on in this case? They'd, they'd be working on, on they'd be ruling on state term limits. What, they've, what they ruled prior in 1995 was on, on congressional. And the U.S. Constitution specifically sets out the criteria and the qualifications for U.S. representatives. But they didn't touch state term uh, lawmakers. So that's going to get into, uh, that's going to be a big decision, obviously, whenever it comes down. So if one's trying to anticipate what the U.S. Supreme Court might do, you'd look to see all the other instances of lifetime bans on term limits. Yes. One of which is our own Constitution limiting the President of the United States. That's true. Do you think that would be a strong message to, uh, that the Supreme Court would listen to? Uh, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. I mean, you can also take the other side and they said, well, they, they struck down the term limits for the congressional representative. So you can take it each way. I, this is a very hard court to read. As you can tell in the last term, there were a lot of five to four decisions. So, uh, but for California right now, it's going to have, things will have to move very quickly, obviously, because we're having, 1998 is going to be a big year in California. Well, in this oral argument, which is coming up in a few minutes, who starts first? Uh, it'll be the plaintiffs, the, the appellants who start first. Um, and I believe, <laughs> I just want to make sure about that, um, the one who, who's bringing the appeal. Well, actually, that might be the state. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to fudge on that for now. Uh, but when the first speaker gets to speak, how long is it? It's roughly about half an hour. I, and is there a question period that goes on with this too? Oh yes, they'll be, they'll be jumping in and uh, and probably interrupting them, and you'll probably get an idea how the three judges are going to uh, lean, which way or the other. And the total length of this oral argument it's, is what? It's about an hour. After the oral argument, about how long do you think before there'll be a ruling? Well, you know, it can be months, it could be years. However, and this is an unusual case because this is on an expedited uh, pace. The judge who ruled, the, that ruling by Judge Wilkin was only in April. Now, usually the Ninth Circuit can take a long time before it actually hears arguments and makes a decision, but they, see, they recognize that this was on an ex expedited schedule. You have to remember, we've got, by 1998, you could have all, the, all 120 state legislators out of office. And so there's going to be statewide elections next year. You, there's going to be f uh, financing, fundraising, campaigning this fall. And they'll, you have to file by February. So it's all a very tight schedule. So I would anticipate we'd have a decision in a few months. Are there any polls that indicate whether there is more or less support for term limits since 1990? Uh, actually, there was a poll I was taking in California and found that there was still support for uh, term limits. How long have you been covering the courts? Uh, about 15 years. 
And how long with uh, the Chronicle? Uh, ten years. As an attorney, you are an attorney. Yeah. Uh, did you ever practice? No. Has the legal training helped you in your reporting on reporter on uh, lawyers in the courts? Oh, I think it's definitely helped. I think it's uh, a lot of times you'll have lawyers who will go out of their way to try to explain things, and you're, if you're on a deadline and you have like a half an hour, you can you you say I'm a lawyer, and they'll they'll breathe a sigh of relief and and skip on to their point. Uh, I think it also helps because you have to simplify things so much in the law, but you don't want to um, simplify them so that you get things wrong. And the law is full of subtleties and what you emphasize and what you don't. So if you have that legal background, I think it gives you a little more confidence. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other cases that you've covered that we might have heard about? Uh, well, I recently covered the civil trial of O.J. Simpson. You might have heard about that. Mm. <laughs> uh, which was very interesting. Uh, there's, you know, you can cover the California Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, but there's still nothing quite like the drama of a trial. And unlike the criminal trial, in which uh, I covered t some of that, um, the civil was more of a pure trial in which you saw the arguments, you saw the power of rhetoric and the power of, of legal reasoning, and then you felt the drama of a, a verdict. And I don't know if you've been in a courtroom recently where you hear that verdict. There's nothing like that. It's very exciting. And it was pretty exciting, I'll tell you that, that night. Another case? Um, let's see. I did. I don't know if you heard about the uh, sexual harassment case, by that the verdict, the record-setting verdict against Beck, Baker and McKenzie, which is the world's largest law firm. And there was a secretary who filed suit and um, in San Francisco, and that was a couple of years ago. And there was a partner who was a great rainmaker, very successful, and apparently he had sexually harassed six other women and there was a record-setting verdict of 7.2 million dollars against Baker and McKenzie which was enormous um, executions. Uh, we've had five in California since the death penalty was reinstated in 1977 the first being Robert Alton Harris. I don't think there's anything. I remember in April of 1991, four days before he was to be executed, we walked into a federal courtroom, expected this three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit to say, go ahead with the execution. What happened was one of the judges came back on and said, I'm staying this execution. There was nothing like quite like that. It took off. I mean, there was an enormous scramble, and essentially it gave Robert Alton Harris an extra year of life. Back to Bates versus Jones. Uh, what should we be looking for as we watch the oral argument? I think you should see what questions are asked, what they emphasize, um, if they are, uh, you know, the, the two sides will be making certain arguments. One is that uh, this does, those that, that are defending Prop 140 will be saying that this does serve a legitimate interest. It is, uh, it basically, this is the best way to fulfill those interests of getting rid of politicians, showing that they have too much, uh, too many perks, too much an advantage, uh, and that the power of incumbency is just too great, and this is a way to kind of get the political flow going. On the other side, you'll see the arguments that uh, this has upset the, the balance, it's unconstitutional because voters have a right to, to vote for who they want and this, this violates that right and as well as politicians have the right to run for office. So, and you'll see uh, as far as whether the judges start asking, well, are there other alternatives besides a lifetime ban? So I would see, ask them what they hone in on on their questions because that'll be the big, biggest tip for you. Well, you'll be there and you'll be writing a story about it. Probably. And how will you focus uh, the story? Will it be on uh, what is said by the lawyers or what is said by the judges or both? Probably both. I mean, usually, you know, in oral arguments, they have their own, uh, each is different. And it depends on the lawyers and it depends on the judges. But the judges will dictate how things go. It depends on how much, how persuasive the arguments are by the lawyers and also what the judges want them to emphasize. Why is this argument on television? This is, after all, a federal court. Well, there is, but they do allow it. Uh, the only exception in the federal court is uh, our death penalty cases, in which they don't allow it. But uh, we're not talking about uh, state courts and the aftermath of O.J. Simpson. As a print reporter, primarily, uh, what's your view of having uh, the television cameras in there? Uh, I, I, I am all in favor of television. I think that, unfortunately, I think people feel that there's a negative because of what they've seen in the criminal trial. But 
Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have been judges and lawyers, and they say, actually, you forget about the camera, uh, that there is actually, the people act a little better than normal. Uh, unfortunately, I think this was, you know, this was an equivalent of hard copy as far as the Simpson criminal trial, and I think there was too many people were, there was a lot of posturing. That usually, usually you don't see that. And I think it can be very, very educational. Now, quite frankly, a lot of trials can be extremely dry. So, you know... <laughs> But I do think it does serve a purpose. I think court TV is terrific. How would you characterize, in terms of dryness or not, what we're going to be hearing in the next hour? Oh, I think it'll be terrific. I think that uh, certainly Judge Reinhardt is not shy about asking questions, and I don't think you'll, I don't think you'll be falling asleep. Harriet Chang, legal affairs writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Thank you very much. Thank you. now hear argument in uh, Bates against Jones. Uh, we have allotted uh, on the record 20 minutes per side, but uh, we're going to allow a half an hour per side. And uh, I think it's the view of the panel members that we would like you to concentrate on the merits if you have important points about procedure that you wish to make. You're not foreclosed, obviously, but uh, we have the sense that your time will be best used uh, on the merits. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Judge Fletcher and uh, members of the court. Uh, my name is Joseph Remcho. I'm representing the plaintiffs in this case. Um, I want to address, obviously, the merits of the claim. And as the court indicated in its uh, pre-hearing pre order, a few minutes at the end of my time to talk about the merits of the stay issue. Oh, I was confused. Didn't you win below? Uh, yes, we did, Your Honor. We, we were told to uh, start in this fashion because we had filed the uh, uh, stay petition. But we're well, happy to allow uh, Mr. L. Haig to start first. Well, it seems to me that you won the case. Yeah, who told you this? <laughs> uh, the clerk said that you'd go by your normal uh, way of operating, Your Honor. But we're quite happy to... Uh, Take a seat and let Mr. L. Haig. Uh, Our again. normal Thank way you. of operating is to hear from the losers. <laughs> <laughs> May it ever be so, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Einar L. Haig. Uh, I represent, along with co counsel uh, Linda Kabadik, uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, in this matter, uh, representing the defendant intervenors. Uh, will be uh, Deborah Lefetra. Uh, we will be allocating 10 minutes of our time uh, to uh, Ms. Lefetra and reserving three minutes for rebut. Your Honors, um, every appellate decision to consider the issue whether term limits violate the First and Fourteenth Amendment uh, has concluded that they do not. Uh, the Supreme Court in Moore concluded that the issue uh, did not even raise a substantial federal question. This is not surprising, I think, uh, because as my uh, colleague Lawrence Tribe has stressed in his constitutional law treatise, <coughs> the core purpose of the voting rights doctrine is to prevent the legislature or prevent lawmakers from entrenching themselves in office through manipulations of the voting process. That's not the view of the Supreme Court, even though it may be the view of Professor Tribe, uh, as I read your article. Uh, as I read your article, the Supreme Court concluded that term limits struck the court as patently undemocratic. Uh, the Supreme Court in Thornton concluded that the qualifications clause of the United States Constitution did include uh, that view uh, that, uh, term lim that any, any qualification any restriction on who voters could vote for uh, conflicts uh, with the rule that they should, their desires should be completely uh, unfettered. 
Uh, but the Supreme Court did not uh, say uh, that the First and Fourteenth Amendment uh, would be violated by term limits. Indeed, uh, they uh, very much disclaimed any such notion, saying at the end of their opinion that, of course, any qualification, uh, for example, I mean, one might note a minimum age, uh, a residency requirement, any qualification for office does preclude the voters uh, from voting uh, for whomever they please, uh, but it was not their province to decide the merits generally uh, of such qualifications. In that there, case, because they were deciding under the Constitution a federal question, they didn't have to decide the question of whether a state provision would be unconstitutional. That was not their province in that mm -hmm. case. But I think as you accurately stated, they proceeded from the assumption that term limits are patently undemocratic. And as you said, what really seemed to motivate the court was a broader premise. The democratic principles give voters an unfettered right to vote for whomever they please, mm -hmm. as you characterized their views. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Uh that you are closely reading uh, my article. Well, not as closely uh, uh, as I would have liked. I wish we'd known you were uh, going to be here. We would have given you a better welcome. Yes. Um, well, I hope uh, that further time will allow you to read another portion of the <laughs> okay. article uh, that specifically notes uh, that, I, that I say the Supreme Court would, of course, recoil uh, from the application of this to state qualifications or state term limits because that would conflict uh, with its precedent uh, on the matter. And it would really be an extraordinary revolution for the court to say that it was a general democratic principle preventing uh, states from adopting any qualifications for state office. That would conflict uh, with the Burdick uh, test, which itself suggests that any reasonable non-discriminatory uh, uh, restriction on who voters can vote for is constitutional. Um, it would certainly turn on its head all the doctrine about special deference having to be paid to uh, state qualifications. And if there was any ambiguity about it, it was certainly resolved by the Timmons case, which came after uh, the Thornton case, and reaffirmed the general voting rights doctrine still provides that reasonable non-discriminatory restrictions, even though they prevent voters from voting for particular candidates, uh, are not uh, by that deemed unconstitutional. In fact, I think Did, actually... Uh, do you regard the uh, opinion of uh, uh, Justice Kennedy in the Thornton case as supporting your position? Um, I do, Your Honor. Uh, Kennedy uh, echoes uh, a lot of what the um, uh, Supreme Court said in terms of not deciding the merits of the question and that there are many good things uh, one can say uh, about term limits uh, as well. They just weren't the things that were considered by the framers who drafted the original qualifications clause. Uh, but Kennedy is also crucially concerned uh, with state sovereignty and about the division of sphere between state sovereignty and federal sovereignty. Here, of course, we have a state qualification imposed on state office. So the value of sovereignty strongly favors upholding it. But even the majority's view, I think, uh, actually supports our position in this case as to sovereignty. Because what the Supreme Court ended up saying was that the part of an entire government could not alter the qualifications of a legislature representing the whole uh, of the government. That is, a state could not alter the qualifications of federal legislators. And that, Here, was a, that was a point of view that Justice Kennedy picked up on, stating that there was a federal citizenship yes. aspect of the Thornton case right. that persuaded him to go. Well, here there's an element of just that argument in the plaintiff's case, because they're saying that dissenting districts, because some districts didn't vote for term limits, should be able to alter the qualifications that have been set by the state as a whole. Uh, when the state voters decided um, to uh, enact uh, term limits. Uh, so certainly if a state, which is actually a sovereign entity, cannot do that to a federal legislature, uh, a district cannot alter the qualifications of a whole when the district is not even a cognizable um, uh, legal entity. Well, uh, go ahead. 
Perhaps you ought to address the uh, 14th Amendment arguments that are being employed mainly by your opponents. Yes. Um, presuming, uh, well, it, if the court applies the precedent that so far has upheld uh, term limits, and that includes a binding Supreme Court authority um, on executive term limits that I would submit uh, cannot be constitutionally distinguished, uh, if, they, if we decide to issue a fresh, the two-part test that applies um, is that the law can only be struck down uh, if it is discriminatory uh, and unreasonable. Uh, if, if those two-part tests has failed, then uh, strict scrutiny uh, would apply. Now, term limits, um, I think, are not uh, discriminatory uh, because they do not discriminate well, against most the... most of the beliefs of your opponents assert to the contrary. Yes. Um, they do assert that uh, there is discrimination against what they term the class of uh, people who prefer experienced uh, legislatures. Uh, but I think to make sense out of any of the Supreme Court doctrine, we have to draw a crucial distinction. And that's a distinction between laws that impose a burden on particular candidates and laws that impose a burden on candidates who reflect a particular viewpoint. It's the latter kind of burden that the Supreme Court has considered uh, discriminatory. And that's what has motivated it to strike down uh, some election laws. The first kind of burden can't be deemed discriminatory, because if it were, uh, then every qualification for office would have to be uh, unconstitutional. Well, some, uh, executive people, some term people see this uh, movement to limit terms as a kind of uh, conservative attack against liberals whose tenure was lengthy. Well, um, term limits on their face are certainly uh, nonpartisan. They apply regardless of what party or political viewpoint uh, you have. Um, the uh, plaintiffs in the court below disclaimed any notion that they were arguing discrimination against a particular uh, political party. Uh, and to the extent we have polling evidence, uh, the support for term limits actually is remarkable for its demograph demographic similarity across uh, groups. Uh, Republicans and uh, Democrats and independents support it nearly equally, women and men. Uh, uh, well, whites, as you know, of course, it doesn't matter what a majority of people want to do if, they, if what they're trying to do is to infringe upon the constitutional rights of others. So whether or not a majority supports it, uh, the question is, what is the effect of this? And as you said, the Supreme Court has given us a clear indication that they believe that this is a, an undemocratic effort to strike at the rights of people. But we don't have to look at liberals or conservatives. We could look at Hamilton or Madison to find that the people should choose whom they please to govern them, as the Supreme Court said Hamilton told us, or as Madison told us that this principle of limiting the people's right to select among candidates is undemocratic because the, because the people can select, it's as, it, that it's as much an infringement on the franchise to limit the candidates as to limit their right to vote, is what <coughs> Madison told us. So it's really not a liberal conservative issue. It's an issue of those who believe in the democratic system mm -hmm. against those who want to limit certain I, rights. I would assume the... Uh ban on uh, presidential third terms is contrary to that dictum. Is that correct? Uh, it is contrary uh, to that dictum. I think one has to understand the dictum uh, as reflecting the framers' views of the qualifications clause in particular. Mm -hmm. They were addressing a concern of uh, various states that the federal legislature would be able to entrench itself in perpetuity in office by adding all kinds of qualifications uh, for office. And they wanted to make clear that that power uh, was not uh, reserved. And one of the reasons, in fact, why it was all very important to make that clear, that it couldn't be added, was that there was no First and Fourteenth Amendment protections available uh, at the time uh, for the courts to review uh, such efforts. So it had to be a relatively absolutist standard. And I think the Thornton case uh, can best be read 
as saying that that absolute standard applies to the interpretation of the qualifications clause. Well, we also have Reynolds versus Sims, which says that undeniably the Constitution of the United States protects the rights of all qualified persons to vote in state as well as federal elections, and then says the right to vote freely for the candidate of one's choice is of the essence of a democratic society, and any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government. So at least... Well, after Reynolds versus Sims yeah. was decided, the Supreme Court decided the Moore case, concluding that executive term limits uh, were constitutional. Well, we, and whatever those... we think of the Moore case, uh, there may be some disagreement as to the effect of it and as to whether it considered the issue of the effect on voters as opposed to the candidate who brought the suit. But since they didn't tell us anything about what they mm -hmm. thought, we will all have to speculate. Uh, yes, but, well... I, I would like to ask you a question. Apparently, the state's position is that what we need to be deciding is whether the voters made a reasoned and reasonable choice. Now, is that the way you would frame what we are to be deciding? Yes, I think the question is whether the, the voters made a uh, rational choice uh, in this matter, uh, not uh, whether the court, if it was decided the question for itself, would conclude that term limits are desirable. Um, and if we answer that question, that's kind of the beginning and the end? Uh, if you answer the first question, that uh, it was rational for them to decide? Yes, I think that um, under the applicable level of scrutiny, uh, that uh, would settle uh, the case. As long as the voters made a reasonable uh, choice, um, uh, then the <clears> law But the uh, level of scrutiny same. suggested by your opponents is obviously strict. Yes. Uh, but that's because they conclude that it is discriminatory and unreasonable uh, in its burden. And uh, I would submit it's not only our term limits. Well, isn't it true that long-established uh, legislators were forced out of office. Uh, yes, that is true. And that their supporters uh, felt aggrieved because they could no longer vote for them. Well, I am sure uh, that there are voters aggrieved by the fact that they can't vote for 20-year-olds. Uh, but the fact that there are such a group of voters does not mean that a minimum age qualification is unconstitutional. Well, what is there, there about incumbency that makes it justifiable to frustrate those desires of which you speak. Oh, I'm glad you asked, because I think uh, what it shows is term limits are, um, uh, and this relates to uh, Judge Reinhardt's questions about Reynolds versus Sim. It's not just that term limits don't trench upon uh, the voter's right to vote for whom they please. They actually facilitate the voters' right to vote for whom they please, and they reduce a discriminatory feature of a system without term limits. But isn't it true so that some voters don't want to have the opportunity to vote frequently for different people? Um, there is some uh, group of voters uh, who, uh, there's some group of voters who oppose term limits, just like I suppose there's some group of voters who oppose every qualification. Um, but, but that your doesn't mean is that they make it more. It makes it more democratic because it equalizes the opportunities, and it, it that the incumbents have an unfair advantage, and therefore people have a fairer opportunity to vote. Yes, yeah, so there's two central problems uh, that, uh, without term limits, uh, limit and coerce uh, voter choice. Um, the limitation comes from the fact uh, that the enormous name recognition advantage of senior legislators yes. creates a huge entry I was barrier. going to ask, would you also propose that movie actors be banned mm -hmm. because they have an unfair advantage, or that athletes, yeah. like the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, or the star of the New York Knicks, or a B movie actor who is known in fairly well in mm -hmm. the state of California, <laughs> don't they have an unfair advantage over the other contenders for that office and shouldn't uh, an we? Excellent, uh, an excellent question. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I think we have to distinguish uh, between the name recognition that uniquely inheres in office and other forms of name recognition. With an incumbent, they are by definition 
the only one who holds the name recognition advantage of being an incumbent. And it's a unique advantage. Celebrities generally, movie stars, uh, football players, uh, or the like, uh, there are a variety of celebrities of that ilk representing a variety of political persuasions. Uh, so the prospect uh, that the voters might, because of the name recognition advantage of some, be saddled uh, with representatives who don't as accurately reflect their views is significantly uh, diminished. Uh, well, that's not the only example. Of course, there are all kinds of people with advantages, uh, people who run for office with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. have the opportunity to get very well known, better known than their opponents. I mean, how are we going to get this level playing field where only the non-entities or the unknown people or those people without any experience have an opportunity to compete? Perhaps, yes. perhaps well, by shaking the dice every now and then. Well, that, I thought of that idea of a lottery. <laughs> Wouldn't that give you the fairest representation? No, I think that that would preclude any voter choice uh, among uh, the candidates. Now, I think if you had some restriction on... What about people with high IQs? Don't they have an advantage over people who aren't as smart? Again, they have an advantage, but it's not a unique advantage. There Why are, isn't it there, unique? There are peoples of all political stripes with high IQs. There are people of all political stripes who are incumbents. But for each district, only one. Uh, and so for each district, they are forced, forced with the choice of do they oust that incumbent and give up the seniority clout that comes with having the senior incumbent, or don't they? Uh, so for them, there's a possibility develops uh, of an ideological gap, of a representative who does not accurately reflect the views uh, of the district, because they're uniquely the incumbent. Um, and if they gave up, if they decided they'd gone too far, they wanted to give up their incumbents. See, they I, don't, face I don't understand the, the, the argument, really. Being a Californian and having been represented by Ronald Reagan, George Murphy, Pierre Salinger, uh, having almost been represented by Michael Huffington because he had a tremendous amount of money, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me a lot of our representatives, senators, governors, are people who have had a unique advantage and who were the only people in that race who held that advantage and were there because of it. And I don't understand why the advantage of being an I don't incumbent. know why then you shouldn't be an ardent supporter of term limits. Right. Well, well often would, I have wished that. <laughs> well, we do. At least it would level the field that, of which you're concerned, or with which you're concerned. Well, but, in, in addition to the what, theoretical... What is it about incumbents that, 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 that makes them somehow mm -hmm. more dangerous than all these other people who have other advantages and are often the only ones running for that office, mainly because they are so well known, that they scare off everyone else in the field. Well, I think actually often uh, celebrities and the wealthy pose the biggest challenge to incumbents, um, and precluding them might uh, further entrench incumbents. But the special thing about incumbents is that they have had experience working the legislative rules, making contacts, uh, and have a lot more influence within the legislature. And we have empirical support uh, for that. that is, the, there isn't a legislature now dominated by movie stars. Uh, but we do have a legislature uh, that, up till the time of, before term limits was enacted, uh, 97 to 100 percent of the incumbents were getting reelected. Uh, they had, uh, as the district court found, a large incumbency advantage. In fact, plaintiff's expert testified that it was 10 to 16 percent. The district court also found uh, that these incumbents were uh, rarely challenged in primaries and often went unchallenged in general elections as well. So it's a real empirical problem. And it's a problem that since the enactment of term limits, the undisputed evidence is uh, there has been a change. Uh, the vote advantage of incumbents has declined from 10 to 16 percent to 4 to 16 percent. The re-election rate uh, has sharply declined, and the number of challengers has increased, and the number of uncontested elections has decreased. The real dispute, I think, here is not about these core facts. The dispute is about uh, what we conclude or what we infer uh, from uh, those uh, undisputed well, you, facts. You know, I, I don't want to 
disagree with all of the wonderful studies that you cite and the marvelous experts who are mainly professors who tell us how life works. Plaintiff's uh, expert professors, I should yes. add. Well, they, uh, they're no more impressive to me than <laughs> any other professor. Don't speak too harshly, Professor. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was one for many years. <laughs> Some of them graduate to be good, good jobs and they <laughs> do the public service. But, uh, and some lawyers do likewise. <laughs> but it, it seems to me that what we are really debating here is a long-standing political, philosophical disagreement about the wisdom of term limits, which is not really our function to decide whether it's good policy or bad policy, whether it gets us good candidates or bad candidates. Uh, that seems to me not the issue for us. It, that was the issue for the electorate. The issue for us, it seems to me, is to deal with the question of the Constitution and whether, uh, it seems to me there are two very important rights, one on each side. Uh, the, what I said to you before about you know, Reynolds versus Sims, saying that any limitation on your freedom to choose your representatives strikes at the heart of representative government. Uh, at the same time, you can find in Gregory versus Ashcroft the statement that the authority of the people, of the states, to determine the qualifications of their most important government officials is an, is an authority that lies at the heart of representative government. So you have, from the Supreme Court, you have statements on both sides that we're dealing with an, a very important right of the state to regulate its own governance and at the same time, we're talking about the right of people to choose from who, uh, who they want to vote for. And we somehow have to reconcile two very important constitutional <coughs> doctrines and determine which overrides the other. Well, I think they're not as inconsistent as they might seem, because often restraints on, uh, apparent restraints on choice make choice freer. Um, for the well, that sounds like the argument that the Supreme Court rejected in Buckley versus Vallejo, which is if we just reduce the speech of some people, it will make the speech of other people mm -hmm. heard better, and that that, they said, is contrary to the heart of the First Amendment. Well, I'm not advocating a change in speech. It's just uh, a, a change in the structure um, of, uh, of the voting process. And I think... Uh, to get back to Professor Tribe's view, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, of it. That is that the point at which you uh, second guess the way uh, the lawmakers or the electorate have decided to structure their voting process is the point at which it seems they're just feathering their own nest. Well, the question, and, again, we're back to the merits of, of whether term limits are good and whether you know, people who serve in public office are serving their own Ness, instead of going out and being lobbyists and working, getting 10 times as much to influence the government. And, you know, I mean, there are arguments on both sides. You could say when you have people there without experience, the run, ones who run the government are the lobbyists. Mm -hmm. But that's, again, I say not the issue before us. My question to you is, given these two critical constitutional questions or principles, and given the fact that you say that the people have the right to choose one system uh, by a reasoned vote, even though it may override the other principle and may serve to limit their choice among candidates. My question to you is, doesn't that reasoned choice have to be clearly put to the people so that they clearly know that they are rejecting a fundamental constitutional right of a lot of other people? Well, um, I think uh, that they not, did understand. Was it not so put? Um, I think they did. Actually, can I ask a procedural question first? I, in responding to the questions, I've gone substantially over uh, my time. I'm happy to answer questions as long as you have them. But uh, How about answering this question? Okay, just this question. And then. Judge Sneed's question, which is, was it clearly put to the voters? Yeah, I think it was clearly put to them. I think. The, well, the, first, the first question, should it not could, be Could he answer put? the question? No, I asked right? the one first, and then you said, and it was, was it? So if you would answer it in order, 
Is it important <coughs> that it be clearly put? I would, put? I would, and then I I would prefer the gentleman answer Judge, anyway. Which Judge, is, and then well, Judge Sneeds, was it clearly I guess I, I, don't I want you to answer both questions. <laughs> <laughs> so In whichever I. order you prefer. Um, I think, I can't think of any Supreme Court doctrine that says that the, the people who vote for qualifications first must consider uh, the constitutional dimensions. As you said before, no, no, I, I asked the merits. They, that's not the question where they have to understand. The question is, must it, sh must it be clearly put mm -hmm. to them so they understand not the constitutional dimensions, but what they're voting on? Well, I think it was clear what they're voting on. No, that wasn't the question. The I question is, must it be yes put? must it be clearly put to them so that they know what they are voting on, so that they know they are adopting these term limits for life? Um, well, I think if the question is, should it be clearly put to them or adopting term limits for life, uh, yes. And I think the, uh, the answer is yes, that is yes. And the answer to Judge Sneed's question would be yes, it was clearly okay, uh, put to them. Okay, that's fine. That answers the question. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Since your colleague has used up your time, and I guess we helped, I will give you a little extra time here. Thank you very much, Judge Fletcher. May it please the court, I'm Deborah Lefetra, representing the proponents of California's term limits law. I think the crux of this case is the severity of the burden, and this goes to uh, Judge Reinhardt's question of what is the effect of this? Well, let's look at what is the effect of this. In, a, in one district, over the course of 50 years, there will be a maximum of six individual state senators who will not be able to run under the term limits law. Under a, in a single assembly district, over 50 years, there will be exactly a maximum of eight individuals who could be termed out under this law. And so in a single district, over 50 years, there's 14 people total affected. This is not a severe burden on the voters in those districts. Well, you're speaking maybe about a burden on the candidates rather than the voters, isn't that right? No, Judge Fletcher. What I'm referring to is when the voters go to the ballot and they want to vote for whomever they choose, they are restricted in a number of ways. They cannot vote for felons. They cannot vote for people who have not lived in the district for uh, less than a year. And they cannot vote for, for a senator who has served more than two terms after 1990 or an assembly member who has served for more than three terms. So there are all sorts of restrictions. My point, Your Honor, is that unlike the felon law, which restricts these people from voting for literally thousands of felons in a single district, this law affects six, a maximum of six, assuming there's no retirements, there's no indictments, six people over 50 years. And then plaintiff's expert Jacobson came on and said, well, how many more people? Who would get the opportunity to, to serve in office because of the term limits law? And he said that across the state, in just one decade, 240 people would be given the privilege to serve in the California legislature because of term limits. Well, you're not really arguing that term limits are unimportant and they really don't have much effect. I mean, the argument that was made to the voters is you can get rid of those people who are running the legislature. They've been there too long. Uh, you have to get rid of the leadership, look at their policies. It was a, it's a, it's clearly has a real impact on the voters to not be able, as, Je as Justice Kennedy said in uh, Thornton, that, that it, not the least of the incongruities is that you can burden the rights of resident voters, he said in federal elections, but it's obviously the same, by reason of the manner in which they earlier had exercised it. If the majority of voters had been successful in selecting a candidate, they would be penalized from exercising the same right in the future. It may be that you know it's not terribly important that you remove an entire membership from the legislature as you would over a, a fairly short period. Uh, but it, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't see how you minimize the effect. I, I you know, I, there may be very good arguments for this, but to say it's unimportant, it doesn't really affect the voters to say they have to turn out their entire legislature. 
Your Honor, in no way did I mean to suggest that term limits are not important. They are extremely important, and they are important because they increase competition and political opportunity. And the Supreme Court has consistently stated through Anderson, Monroe, Lubin, and Clements that the availability of political opportunity is the touchstone for these ballot access voting rights cases, and they do merge the two. And so what term limits do is they create this tremendous opportunity, not only for people to serve in the legislature, but for people to run to serve. When we look well, in that's the- That's a very good argument for voting for term limits. Your Honor, it is also a very good argument for the constitutionality of term limits because it goes to the burden. And while we've been talking about sort of the policy areas in, involved with term limits- Well, let me what, ask you the same question I asked the professor. Uh, isn't that the same Buckley versus Vallejo argument? Yes, look at what it does for other people. We're limiting the rights of, to vote for these people, but look how it expands the opportunity for others, which is what they said with the First Amendment in Buckley versus Vallejo. If we only limit the rights of some people to spend money, then other people will be able to be heard. And the court said, that's not the way the First Amendment works. Isn't that same argument true here? No, Your Honor. The, the argument here is the argument that came out in Burdick and in Rodriguez. When we talk about the right to vote, maybe it would be helpful just to define exactly what that is. And Your Honor got to that to some extent talking about Reynolds. But what the right to vote is, is the right to vote on an equal basis with everyone else in the jurisdiction for any qualified candidate. And Reynolds in no way suggests that the right to vote encompasses the right to vote for an unqualified candidate. Burdick specifically rejected that. Because in Burdick, which struck down a ban on right in voting, told lots of people they couldn't vote for whomever they wanted to, whomever their first choice was. And Timmons, which is just a few months ago, came back and said the same thing. So you don't get your for first choice. Well, you can find now, someone wait, else. Didn't Timmons say that somebody who was on the ballot couldn't be on the ballot twice? What Timmons said is that a political party who wishes to have somebody as their nominee cannot have that person as their nominee if they are somebody else's party nominee. Because the voters already have the opportunity to vote for that person. That looks at the, it from the candidate's point of view. No, no, though, from the voters' right. view. The, the voter has the right to vote for that person. Then let's back up to Burdick, which, okay. makes, which makes the point very clear. Footnote 10 in that decision states that referring to the dissent's uh, apparent assumption that people have the right to vote for whomever they choose, the majority says that is, and I quote, simply wrong. That has never been the law as far as these ballot access cases are concerned. And so this restriction is certainly within the people's rights right. to enact. Looking at California history, we look back and in 1966 through initiative, the voters chose to professionalize their legislature. 24 years later, they decided they were unhappy with that to some extent and modified it. And they Didn't modified the term it. limits case explain all of those cases, including Burdick, and saying that all our, all our prior cases are regulatory elections, regu they regulate the manner of the election, they don't exclude candidates from ballots? Your Honor, that was in reference to cases uh, about Article I, Section 4 of the U.S. Yes. Constitution. No, but this is when they described the prior cases and they said they were not substantive qualifications rendering a class of potential applicants ineligible for ballot positions. Isn't that what the court said in the term limits case? Your Honor, that can only make sense if it, it talks about things like uh, the petition cases and the nominating convention cases. It doesn't make sense to apply that to cases that involve other status-based qualifications. Well, I'm not such here to say the Supreme Court decisions always make sense. All I, was, all I said is, isn't that what they said? The Supreme Court said in Thornton that it was not resolving the debate on term limits. It was not our province to decide that. The Supreme Court noted that more than half the states had enacted term limits and they did not presume to, to say anything about those. Um, well, it wasn't a decisive vote in Thornton, and to repeat what I mentioned earlier, cast by Justice Kennedy, and his was bottomed on the notion that there, it was an impairment of federal citizenship to permit a single state to impose a term limit on uh, senatorial candidates who were serving in the United States Senate. Yes, but This is a federal matter that requires a consistency 
within the states. Isn't That's absolutely true, Judge Sneed. And Judge, Justice Kennedy also said that the Constitution created a legal system, unprecedented in form and design, establishing two orders of government, each with its own direct relationship, its own privity, its own set of mutual rights and obligations to the people who sustain it and are governed by it. And we m mesh this with the Rodriguez case, which says that the people can set the qualifications on their own uh, legislators. We mesh it with Gregory V. Ashcroft, which says that the right to the states to establish qualifications has force even against the proscriptions of the 14th Amendment. And that's a quote. We well, have you know that the Supreme Court just said you can't set qualifications against the proscriptions of the Fourth Amendment, which seems far less basic, doesn't it? Your Honor, the essence of this case under the First and Fourteenth Amendment is to look at whether the the burdens on the voters are severe. They are not. They can vote for anyone on the ballot. They can vote for termed out people for other offices. Every plaintiff in this case was able to vote in the March primary, voted in the, in the general election. They all said who they were going to vote for. Some of them volunteered and gave money, monetary support to their candidates. They all voted for a qualified candidate. The people they voted for, in fact, won are, and are serving in the state legislature. Their voting rights have suffered absolutely no constitutional injury. As such, the state's uh, reasons need only be reasonable and non-discriminatory. And I think Professor L. Haig showed that that is the case. The people are entitled to make this policy judgment. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Joseph Remcho for the plaintiffs. <coughs> Pardon me. I'd like to, um, if I may, make some preliminary remarks with respect to the important rights that are uh, before the court today, and then to respond to some of the issues that were raised uh, in the discussion with, uh, with counsel. In California, the, the point of contact between a citizen of the state and his or her state government is that person's legislator. If a Californian is unhappy with how a law works, or thinks we need a new law, or thinks that the bureaucracy is being unfair to him or her, the place that Californian goes is to the legislator. I thought it was to the initiative. <laughs> <laughs> they ought to be going to the legislator far more than the initiative. And in fact, they do on many of the matters that uh, they don't have the money to put initiative on the ballot with. Apparently, um, the money is available many times, as this and other cases illustrate. Uh, that, that, that's, I think that's right. But this case is really about, the, obviously, <coughs> about the right of individuals to choose that legislator, that person who, in a representative democracy, is the point of contact. Well, and there are <coughs> I have problems with enshrining the right of a particular individual to vote for a particular individual uh, within the Constitution of the United States <clears throat> as it relates to a state regulating its own uh, I don't think this case uh, is about legislative structure. It, it, it appears to me that you've got to bottom your argument in some fashion on the Constitution of the United States. Now, where do you go? We go, uh, Your Honor, where the district court went. The district court bottomed her argument on three critical cases as well as a I number want to of factual I want to know the clause in the Constitution. The clause is the 14th uh, Amendment to the United States Constitution. Which, the first which, which, which clause? Article 1. I mean, the 14th Clause 1 of the 14th Amendment. And under that, the incorporation of the First Amendment? That's correct, Your Honor, as well as the equal protection aspects of that clause. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read the 14th Amendment fully? I have, Your Honor. Do you know what it uh, provides um, in uh, Section 3? 
This is what you get for dealing with a former professor. <laughs> Read the first sentence. You can this read it out loud. The disqualification for office provisions? Yes. Oh, certainly. That no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress uh, or under any state, which I assume is where the uh, mm -hmm. court is going, um, who have shall engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States yeah. or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Now, that's but, not within Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, is it? No, it's not, Your Honor. No, why, not, why was it put in a different section? Well, I wasn't there at the drafting, so I don't know why it was put there, but I well, can't. Well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean by and that, think that I mean by, Matt, by that, to be perfectly honest with you, I've read the entire record of the enactment of the 14th Amendment, and not for this case necessarily, but I have done that. And I can assure you that there was nothing in the legislative record of the 14th Amendment that suggested that uh, Section 1 had anything to do with the sort of problem we've got today. Now, that doesn't mean that it might not have. It just means there's nothing in the historical record. So we're really working with case law that has evolved out of Section 1. I have absolutely no quarrel with that. We are working with the case law. Now, <clears throat> if that is so, aren't there winners and losers in this battle over term limits? You represent the losers. Is not that so? We represent the losers in the initiative. All right. Now, battle. that's correct. Would your case be stronger? Had the election gone 60-40 rather than 52-48? Our case, I don't think it would have made any difference whatsoever to our case, whether it had gone 95-5 or 51.1 to 49.9. So whichever way it goes, you <clears throat> uh, would contend that no term limits can survive the Constitution. Well, I'm here to contend that these term limits may not survive constitutionally. These are term limits that throw out of office. What term Spitzier. limits then would you concede might survive? I don't. Our position is that term limits. Any term so limits. So any term limits. So if it was 20 years, they couldn't survive. Oh, I, I will. Uh, I would say, obviously, Your Honor, there is a point at which the length of a term is such that it's a trivial difference, that it's a slight burden on the rights of voters, whether or not um, that term limit operates to restrict their right to vote. So I don't have a problem with saying that so a 60-year term would Only if you knocked out the Senator Thurmond's might you, would you have I a safe harbor? I'd like to see Senator Thurmond stay. I think he's got the right, he represents his district's interests. <laughs> That's exactly what Representative But you would concede about. that if it was aimed exclusively at that type of character, it might be all right. Is that correct? No. No, I, I wouldn't concede that. I um, would. So there's, there's, there's no way to have term limits under the First Amendment, as you say. I said. don't believe that the First and Fourteenth Amendments permit that restriction on the right to vote, the right to be a candidate, and the right to associate. So you take unless, the ab absolute position there. No, I. I I'm sorry, Your Honor, let me, if I may finish. Unless those term limits, the combinations of the way they operate, the number of terms, and whether or not it's a lifetime ban, are so expansive as to make the burden on the rights of voters trivial. And I can certainly think what, of such a situation. So what, I would not be an absolutist in that sense. What, I, what situation can you think of? Well, as I said, if you had a consecutive ban that after 70 years, or 73 years, which is in other the words, a meaningless ban. Yes, I think that at some point it gets trivial and we're not here to decide when. <clears throat> what we are here to decide is whether six years and a lifetime ban is a severe burden. Well, and I now would let let me ask you, uh, taking your position then as, as you stated it, um, you represent 
individuals who lost. They didn't want to be subjected to term limits, either as office holders or as voters. I represent some, Your Honor, who lost in that. And I also represent some who were not even of voting age or not even in the state. And but no, no matter state how, order. isn't it true that no matter how the case turns out, there are losers? I think that's a fair assumption, yes. And so their rights to have the kind of legislature they want would be frustrated? I think the, correct, the court correctly points out. In other words, is, are, are the, aren't they always losers, no matter how this is decided, your way or the other way? Absolutely, and I don't think the court is here to make policy judgments about winners and losers. But we must, shouldn't we, if uh, we're deciding this kind of issue under no, the Constitution? No, I think what the, court, what the court must do is determine whether you're telling us that there are people who have lost something. That's right, and something I'm very so, important. My response to you is, isn't it true that someone will lose something no matter how this case is decided? Th that is, they will lose something. Of course they will lose something. They wanted the right, to those who won in the uh, uh, vote to fix term limits, wanted the opportunity to vote for someone else. And they felt that they were being stymied by the in power of the incumbency. If we decide the case your way, they will lose. They will have lost in their effort to prevent those who want to vote for experienced legislators but they from want, doing so. But they want the something just as valid. Well, that's my point. And they're no more entitled to that than if they said that lawyers can't run, or high school teachers, or football players, or oh, wealthy people. Oh, I, or the I, poor. I don't think you really mean that. I do mean that, Your Honor. I don't think they are any more entitled to say that. That is a specific discrimination against a particular class of people that is having nothing to do with the, their pre, uh, prior careers as legislators and the power that accrued there, too. My point is a very simple one. Whatever injury you're speaking of may be inflicted on the other side when the uh, results of the vote are reversed. I, I, I really think not, Your Honor. I think that what has happened here is that the side that thinks that, you know, experience is a curse and that knowledge is too much power and that we can all, the California can be run by those like Cincinnati who put down the plow and go fix government for a year and return to the farm. That those people isn't have that, said... Isn't that a judgment that the people of California are entitled to make? No, there are no more... Those people are no more entitled to say that those of us who believe that experience does teach and that knowledge is useful and that the seventh largest economy in the world ought not to be run by neophytes, ought to, those people ought not to have their right to make that choice abridged by those who hold an opposite view. That's what the case is about. Well, you put it very nicely. Somebody's going to lose. Some view is going to prevail as a result of whichever way it comes out. And the final point I would like to make to you, who should decide that? The voters of the state? Or three judges, or nine judges as a case, justices as a case may be? There's no question that under the circumstances of this case, this court ought to make that decision. And the reason- I'm aghast. <laughs> well, let me tell you why. He's right? shocked, absolutely I'm, shocked. I'm aghast that you would, <laughs> let me you try would to want to put the fate of uh, the millions and millions of people in California with respect to this year, issue in the hands of a handful of judges. Absolutely, and let me explain how and why that's so important. Uh, isn't, isn't it the job of federal judges to determine whether the Constitution is violated and some people are deprived of their constitutional rights. I'd be shocked if you said no to that. It's, but and I'm not going to shock you with that issue. Both sides, on the basis of the analysis, are going to be impinged on in one way or another with respect to voting. Let me give you another example of that. For 50 years in California, Californians made a decision by an initiative constitutional amendment, not initiative, a constitutional amendment that they all voted on 
that a rural vote in California was to be worth 10 or 20 times the value of an urban vote in California. They thought they had good reason. So are the they Reynolds again? The Reynolds against some analysis. And the United States Supreme Court says you can't do that. The majority may not infringe upon the rights of this, the minority. This people. involved no dilution of any single voter's potency at the poll. I think it's far worse. Instead of Tom Bates going to the legislature and having to fight with 10 other legislators from rural counties because he's outnumbered, but at least having the opportunity to present his views, he can't go at all. Well, let's assume, That's more pernicious. Let's assume you get over the first hurdle and that you convince Judge Sneed that uh, the rights of people who don't want educated, informed office holders and experienced office holders and who don't want others to vote for those people. I, I would accept the term <laughs> experienced, not educated and uninformed. Right, assume, That's a canard. Assume you get over that hurdle and say that people who want inexperienced legislators can't deprive those who want to vote for experienced ones of their rights. Assume that when you weigh the two rights. Aren't you also faced with a serious constitutional problem in the right of the state to decide what form of government it really wants? If it wants to go to a citizen legislator form of government, uh, that's been a debate you know, since before the Constitution. Uh, it may not be a very smart, intelligent form of government. It may not be a very desirable one. But why can't a state, just as it can choose, well, I forget what that, just, why can't a state, if it wants, say, we want legislators who come straight from the farm, and that's what we want, and when we want to vote for them, if they've had one term in office, that's enough. That's the form of government we choose. Why doesn't a state have the right under the Constitution? I think Judge Reinhardt loaded the question a bit with saying the farm. No one is talking about Well, the if they come, come from the ghetto, if uh, wherever they come from. Uh, come nothing straight, in, this, nothing straight, in this bill relates to either one. Come straight from civilian life in their local communities, and they don't want people who have any experience uh, they really want citizens who have not been tainted by the experience in government. Now, that may not be a desirable form, but what, why shouldn't a state have the right to experiment with that form of government? For, for the same reason that the state can't, uh, as was struck down in Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Sims, mm -hmm. can't deliberate, can't dilute the vote of voters. There's no dilution simply of the because, votes. I'm sorry. My goodness. No delusion. You, you can't do that simply because a majority may want it. For example, I make a distinction. If a majority of the state, for example, said we want a unicameral legislator, legislature, well, Tom Bates would be out of office. But as so long as Tom Bates has the opportunity and his supporters have the opportunity to compete with everyone else to run for whatever offices are available in California, then the First and Fourteenth Amendment says he ought to be able to do that and that the state has to show a compelling state interest and that that interest is well, served by narrowly tailored means. Why isn't there a compelling state interest in choosing the form of government you want, in choosing an amateur legislator form of government? Uh, it may not be a wise choice, but once the state decides that as its policy, why isn't that a compelling state interest? Let us assume um, for the moment that you say that's a compelling state interest, that, that mm -hmm. you ought to be entitled to, to set the government up the way you want. Um, or let me take two parts of that. Mm -hmm. One is to say, at, if at any time in the matter of voting and candidates and so forth, if it's enough to just say that's the way we want to do it, then the First and Fourteenth Amendment really well, is not going to have just, any It's not just saying that's the way we want to do it. We're saying there's a historic debate over this that went on since before the Constitution. And it was a legitimate, recognized argument uh, that was you know, debated and uh, that a lot of states chose to do. They chose to have term limits. It's, a, it's not just some irrational, arbitrary thing, but it's, as I said, maybe bad policy, but it's something that is a recognized political theory. Uh, why can't a state experiment with that political theory? Or why isn't that a compelling interest? that the state wants to experiment with that form of government? 
because I, th I think it proves too much to say that that is, a, to say that something, that restructuring or running the government the way you want to mm -hmm. is a compelling interest that blanks out everything else is too much. I think the district court had it right, which is to say it is a compelling interest in the sense that you want, the state has, you know, the right to set up its own sovereign government, but because it proves too much, it must be given deference. Well, the, the problem have, with the district but no courts, more than deference. The problem with the district court's analysis, and we haven't even discussed that yet, uh, is that the district court said it's not narrowly drawn or tailored to meet the problem. Well, it all depends on how you define the problem. If the problem is, forget what all these professors say about how elections work. You know, if the problem is that good or bad, whatever it produces, the people of the state want a amateur legislator form of government, and they don't want people to serve who have served previously, well, then it's not, there's no way to narrowly tailor that except to do exactly what the initiative does. If that's the objective and the goal to bring about citizen government, where people who have had experience before are not eligible for the same office, how can you narrowly tailor something? Well, I think in that case, what you're doing is you're defining the, the objective and the right. goal as, as one and the same. So there is no room. Uh, well, isn't that move. always how cases come out? Once you define the issue, don't you know the answer? Uh, I suppose that's right. And I think that this issue has already been defined by the United States Supreme Court in uh, United States term limits versus Thornton where time after time they pointed out the undemocratic nature of, uh, of term limits and the fact that it does restrict within the, the bedrock. Federal, within the federal context. Well, it's quite clear that, that that case was decided in the federal context. Quite clear. Quite clear. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Judge Sneed, the, uh, uh, Justice Kennedy's concurring opinion where he did talk about the federal context. But Justice Kennedy, uh, did allude to the First and Fourteenth Amendments in a way f that obviously is not binding, but certainly leans far more in our direction than in the direction of those who would support well, term limits. I thought he was well within his uh, boundaries of good sense and sound logic to distinguish term limits imposed by a state on the federal Senate. But I, but I think term limits generally, and that's precisely what he did. He also joined in the majority opinion, as he did I recall. He did join in the majority opinion, but his motivation was very clear in, in what he said in his concurrence. Well, well, let me ask you, if, if I may, Your Honor, he joined in that majority opinion. He pointed out the federalism issues, but in the way he, he wrote that, you know, he said, uh, uh, you know, quite apart from any First Amendment considerations, People, that's language that courts and people use when they think there's something to those First Amendment considerations. And I that's what I take from that. I counsel to another topic. Sure, go right ahead. Uh, as I understand it, in the uh, argument before the uh, Supreme Court of California, the state urged an interpretation that uh, would uh, have limited the initiative uh, to exclude lifetime ban, is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Um, however, the Supreme Court said that it could not be so limited, so we are not free to make any limiting uh, uh, restrictions on that uh, initiative to make it constitutional if we were to decide that uh, the uh, lifetime ban goes too far. Is that is that? Accurate? I think that's absolutely accurate, and, and, and all the parties agree that because of the decision made by the United States Supreme Court mm -hmm. that California's term limits are a lifetime ban. You mean by the California Supreme Court? California Supreme Court. California. California. That's what I thought I said. Did I, no, you didn't I'm, say I'm that. I misspoke. Yeah. The decision by the California Supreme Court that they're a lifetime ban is binding on this court, in fact, binding on the United States Supreme Court because it's a matter of state law, and I don't think there's any... Uh, any dispute about that. I might point out that in the, in the uh, California Supreme Court, uh, the, the then Secretary of State, in urging that it not be a lifetime ban, pointed out that it ought not to be a lifetime ban because uh, uh, 
a lifetime, because construing it as not a lifetime ban would be less intrusive of constitutionally protected rights. Well, they lost that the argument, purpose. and we're here now with a lifetime ban. And we have no wiggle room. No, we don't. And let me say this about the lifetime ban, if I, if, if I may. Um, the, all of the political scientists who studied this case, Professor Jacobson, Professor Fiorina for the plaintiffs, and in fact, Professor Petraka for the defense, all said that a lifetime ban was simply not necessary to achieve whatever purposes there might be for term limits. Well, what and does that mean, whatever, whatever purposes? Uh, you know, I, this, well, this, well, this is what bothers me about the t testimony of professors. Uh, <laughs> you know, if that's not, it's just not true. If the purpose is to have people who had not had experience in the legislature, who've come from civilian life, then it's not true that a lifetime ban goes beyond the purposes and that you can achieve it with the lesser. And, and, and I would say to the court that that was not the purpose articulated when the matter was before the voters. It was not the purpose articulated in the California Supreme Court. And it was not the purpose articulated by the Attorney General in the court below. The court had to work with the purposes, and many of them were post hoc rationalizations, that were given to her by the Attorney General and the, and the defendants. And the major purpose that has been put forward from day one with respect to term limits is that we have to get rid of the advantages of incumbency. And that purpose uh, has clearly been shown to be such that uh, term limits, the lifetime ban in California term limits, just reach too far to try to achieve. Because the lifetime ban, after three or four years, uh, after one or two terms, for example, there's very little dispute that any power advantage of incumbency, whether it's fair or unfair, has eroded. So then you have a situation in which uh, Mr. Bates is barred from running against someone who's an incumbent, and it winds up being an incumbency protection act for the new incumbent while keeping out the old incumbent and the voters who would vote for him. But those, the office holders do have the opportunity to run for other offices. Oh, sure, and, and uh, they... Uh, many did. They have many opportunities to do, to do other things. But they, uh, the record below shows, for example, the importance not only to Mr. Bates of being in the assembly, but to Mr. Buckhalter and others who would vote for him, because the assembly is where he has done his best work. It's where he wants to be. It's where they want him. And that's the right that's being burdened. But the right would be burdened on the other side, as I pointed out previously, is the frustration of the will of the majority of the voters. Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting view of the voters, though, because the other side's view of the voter is, is that um, a voter needs to be helped from him or herself that the voter can't be trusted to vote out of office an incumbent whom they don't like. And I just think, as the United States Supreme Court said, that's fundamentally, fundamentally opposite to what representative democracy is all about. This well, case, it's not quite that simple, of course, because you know, voters in Los Angeles don't have the opportunity to decide what person San Francisco may elect, who then may be elected speaker by a lot of voters from other districts. So it's not quite as simple as the voters having the opportunity to reject someone when you're talking about a legislature. Uh, they can only reject their own legislator, but they may be objecting to the incumbency of legislators in other districts. I understand that objection, Your Honor, but in a representative democracy, uh, the voters in Los Angeles ought not to be deciding who represents the voters in Berkeley. The fact is that democracy as practiced, as, as discussed in the Federalist Papers, as was so clear from the history in the United States term limits versus Thornton case as was discussed there, democracy is one in which the individual, the, the people in the district get to choose the person who goes to represent them. They make all sorts of mistakes. They may elect a speaker that nobody else likes. They may pass laws that nobody else likes. Well, but the state, it's up to them. May, the state has an interest in the qualifications of the people in each of the districts. The voters statewide may have some interest in what kind of people may be sent from the various districts. So that all I'm saying is it's not as simple as to say the voters in the district can decide 
because they don't have the unadulterated right to decide everything. The state has some interest in qualifications. Well, Whether like they have enough of an interest here is another question. But it's not enough to say that the individual voters in one district could reject an incumbent. Well, I would, I guess I would agree with that, Your Honor, for example, with respect to things like, you know, we're not going to send felons who are in jail, you know, elect felons who are in jail. That's sort of a, a or general Or people below the age of 18 or so, as Judge Sneed right. said. I mean, maybe we in Los Angeles would like to elect 16-year-olds. But the people in other states say you don't have that. In other parts of the state can say you don't have that option. That, that's right. And I think the, the, the way this all gets sorted out is in the standards set forth by the United States Supreme Court and summarized in Verdict versus Takushi, is you sort it out by saying, is there a burden? Is uh, there a compelling interest for that burden? And is it narrowly tailored? And that's how you sort out things like felons and, and age, uh, you know, youth and so forth. But when you get to the issue of trying to keep somebody out of the legislature because of experience and what type of person that uh, that individual is, then I think you've gone beyond, as the United States Supreme Court, <coughs> you know, really has, I think, shown the way in, in the U.S. Me, you, case, you, beyond democratic principles. Well, you're arguing, of course, a, a frontal attack on term limits, no matter how much, how, how little, it seems to me. And uh, it seems to me that's what you have to do in this particular case. But I find it very strange that in a federal structure such as we have in this country, this nation, that a state cannot uh, choose to impose term limits of a reasonable sort, and I think these are, um, uh, on its own uh, accord, that that's forbidden. I find nothing in the Constitution that really would legitimately support that position. I don't happen to think term limits are a particularly good thing, personally. But uh, that's not my choice. Well, I, and, I, and, I find, and I also am convinced that there are winners and there are losers, no matter how the issue is resolved insofar as individual voters and office holders are concerned. I certainly wouldn't disagree that there are winners and losers. I would just bring the court back to Baker versus Carr, verdict, verdict versus Takushi, I, I find and those, U.S. term limits. I find those completely distinguishable because in those cases you had voters in certain areas of the state having inordinate voting power in relation to others. It was a problem of trying to equalize the power of the individual voter. And that isn't the question here, it seems to me. This goes to the question of the constitutional structure of a state as determined by the people thereof. Mr. I would say so it would appear you're not going to persuade Judge Sneed by your argument. <laughs> <laughs> uh. No. But I, I would say that that was precisely the argument made in Baker versus Carr, that the right to determine your sovereign <coughs> way of operating um, trumped I the repeat, first amendment. Baker against Carr <laughs> involves a, dis a distinguishable, different, separate issue. I would leave it at that and uh, with uh, that fundamental notion. That you and Judge Sneed are in disagreement. That we are in disagreement uh, and uh, that I know Judge Sneed has read the U.S. term limits case, and I understand the federalism aspects of it. But the fact is that just throughout that case is a clear message from the United States Supreme Court of the burden imposed by term <coughs> limits. And I would ask this court to apply the standards set by the United States Supreme Court and to strike down California's lifetime ban on uh, further service in the legislature. Thank you, Counsel. I think we don't need rebuttal in this case, Counsel. We gave your side an extra uh, 10 minutes, and uh, I think any rebuttal has come from the bench. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, court stands adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor.